Good evening. It is a great honor for me to be here. Uh, it, it is particularly a, a special privilege for me to introduce my friend, uh, Robert Tembechian. As I'm sure many of you know, Bob has run the New York State Commission on Judicial Conduct since uh, 2003. Having begun working there in 1976, just two years after the commission's inception. Talk about a true uh, lifetime of public service, uh, Bob. Bob's resume, and, and you can read it in the program, is quite impressive, among other accomplishments. He earned a bachelor's degree from Syracuse University, a Juris Doctor from Fordham Law School, uh, and an MPA from Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. He was also, of course, a Fulbright Scholar in Armenia, where he taught constitutional law and ethics, and even advised Parliament on its adoption of a new constitution after Armenia's independence from the Soviet Union. What I'd like to highlight, however, is the importance of Bob's work as administrator and counsel to the Commission on Judicial Conduct. Most people don't understand the breadth of the Commission's power and how vital it is in upholding the integrity of our judicial system by holding judges accountable, including me. The Commission is charged with investigating complaints against judges and disciplining them for misconduct, in some cases even removing them from the bench. I think the work of Bob, not just Bob, but Bob and his team, all of whom are present here today as a testament uh, to Bob's leadership, their work, I believe, is underappreciated, even by many judges around the state, because the commission's work is largely confidential. The public doesn't hear about complaints against judges or the proceedings of the commission unless the commission has determined that the judge should be admonished, censured, removed, or retired, or if the judge on the formal charges has waived confidentiality. I served at the commission for several years, and I can report that under Bob's leadership, the commission has adopted an approach that I would describe as firm, but compassionate. The level of analysis and the amount of time and dedication Bob and his team give to evaluating complaints against judges is truly remarkable. That's because Bob has a clear understanding of the commission's mandate as well as the commission's importance. As he wrote in the New York Law Journal last year, Vigorous ethics oversight not only heightens faith in the courts, it protects judicial independence, among other things, by absorbing, deflecting, or diffusing criticism that would otherwise be directed at judges. As a New Yorker, I am proud of the fact that we have an independent commission on judicial conduct. And I am thankful that the commission is run by someone with the expertise, the knowledge, the sensitivity, and the dedication of Bob Tembeckian. Indeed, I tend to agree with Bob that the federal judiciary, and I'm directing myself at another level of government, that they should have an independent agency to efficiently fairly and thoroughly investigate complaints against judges and dispense discipline as needed. I would add that such an agency would even benefit greatly from having someone like Bob Tembeckian at its helm. Bob, thank you for your commitment 
to supporting New, York, New Yorkers' confidence in the judiciary by holding our state judges accountable for their conduct. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present to you one of tonight's honorees, a great public servant, my friend, Robert H. Tembetri. Thank you. Your eminences, members of the Armenian Bar Association, my fellow honoree Rod Rosenstein, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> How's that? <laughs> It is a great pleasure for me to be in an Armenian event where the names are pronounced as easily as they are spelled and where Rosenstein is harder for people to say than Tembekjian. <laughs> Thank you, Judge Acosta, my esteemed colleague and friend, for your kind introduction. Listening to you, I realize just how old I am. I guess this ceremony demonstrates, if nothing else, that if you hang around long enough, you will eventually be recognized for something more than a passing resemblance to Mr. Bean. <laughs> all right, it's all right. I'm used to it. I am somewhat bemused given my line of work, that there are so many judges here tonight. <laughs> Perhaps they think this is a valedictory and they came to celebrate my departure. <laughs> Sorry, this is not my retirement dinner. On the other hand, Rod Rosenstein has been leaving his job for months. <laughs> I can tell by the absence of Secret Service that the one person most anxious to see him leave for the last two years is not here tonight. <laughs> Perhaps he was intimidated by today's date. It is, after all, the 25th, and the last person he'd want to hear on the 25th is Rod Rosenstein. Think about that. Rod and I have different relationships to the Armenian American community. He chose to join it, having the good sense to marry Lisa Barsumian. I had no choice in the matter. <laughs> Marrying into such a tight-knit community can be challenging. Just ask Kanye West. <laughs> but growing up Armenian has its own confusions and burdens from trying to understand why people jokingly called us starving Armenians when every meal at our house looked like Norman Rockwell's Thanksgiving, <laughs> to the unrelenting sense of responsibility, not just to make the family proud, but to perpetuate a 5,000-year-old civilization that was nearly obliterated by genocide in 1915. It seems fitting to make a few observations tonight on the twin themes of the program, which happen to reflect two arcs of my own life, public service and Armenian ancestry. Let me express special appreciation to the Armenian Bar Association for this meaningful personal recognition, and more significantly, for recognizing the value of public service in a political age poisoned by cynicism, narcissism, and greed. These are not easy days to be in public service. <clears throat> Our national leadership has strayed so far from the idealism embodied in the call of our 35th president to ask what we could do for our country. 
it has now become a daily routine of the 45th to denigrate the devoted men and women of civic institutions. A respected court is derided as disgraceful for disagreeing with him. An honorable public servant is disparaged for directing a witch hunt. A dignified United States Senator is ridiculed for having become a prisoner of war. Ancient cultures are denigrated in malicious stereotype. And sometimes an entire gender is devalued and abased. The contempt is all the more frightening for being so casual and enabled by those in a position to stand up to it, but who instead prove Edmund Burke's point that all tyranny needs to gain a foothold is for people of good conscience to remain silent. And yet the spark, <laughs> and yet despite this dark and pessimistic state of affairs, I remain optimistic about our country and its resilience for two reasons. First, I am fortunate every day to see the best of what state government can achieve. I'm surrounded by dedicated, principled professionals who do the hard, unheralded work of justice day in and day out. It is not and should not be easy to discipline or remove any officer of constitutional government. But if the rule of law means anything, we must not shy away from holding a powerful official accountable when circumstances demand it. This is what my colleagues at the Commission on Judicial Conduct do, and I am honored to be associated with them. The second reason for my optimism is that I'm Armenian. All of us here are the descendants of immigrants, many of whom were grimly acquainted with persecution. But there is something in my family history that is profoundly pertinent to deeply disturbing events in our troubled country today. I am the grandson of illegal immigrants to the United States. Imagine the irony. Imagine the irony here at the Yale Club, whose very name signifies privilege, the grandson of swarthy, non-English speaking, impoverished, undocumented aliens is addressing an audience filled with judges and law enforcement officials. At the very moment, a continuing immigration tragedy is playing out on our southern border. Now, before any ICE agents in the audience get excited, I was born in Brooklyn. And as Ruth Gader, Bader Ginsburg would attest, despite our strange sounding native accents, Brooklyn is still a part of the United States. And the 14th Amendment's guarantee of birthright citizenship has not yet been repealed. Still, and always, I am the grandson of illegal immigrants. All of my grandparents were born in Turkey in the 19th century and miraculously survived the genocide that claimed a million and a half Armenians in 1915. My mother and her brother were born to displaced persons. The couple that later adopted them when their parents died also met as refugees. My father was five years old in 1915 and had vivid memories of the genocide his whole life. His parents were stateless for years. And they tried without success to migrate legally to the United States. But immigration quotas were small. You might say the country was full. So exiled from their homeland, they got to Canada on forged papers, took a ferry from Windsor to Detroit in 1926, and they never looked back. Within a year, my grandfather was dead, and my widowed grandmother and two of her children were arrested 
and detained at Ellis Island for deportation hearings. But 90 years ago, my grandmother was not separated from her children. She was not forced back across the border or held incommunicado. She and her children were promptly released on bond pending trial. And although she and the boys were ordered deported, she argued that returning to Turkey was a death sentence. And for its part, the Turkish government would not take them because it did not acknowledge that Armenians had a right to return. So her expulsion from the United States was postponed for six months, then another six, again and again. She returned to her linen factory job and cared for her family. In other words, my immigrant, illegal immigrant Armenian grandmother was reprieved by a government that understood it could both uphold the law and postpone its consequences for humanitarian reasons. A it was a government that took time to examine and differentiate among the many who sought its refuge and that did not invoke scripture to promote exclusion at the expense of decency or justice. That is the country to which my grandmother was faithfully devoted for 60 more years, working hard, paying taxes, raising children, and eventually becoming a citizen in 1955. It is the nation her three sons grew up and joined the army to defend in World War II, each returning home to build a successful small business, two dry cleaners, one photo engraver. It is the country to which her grandchildren serve today. My sister Renee is an Episcopal priest, and I am New York State's Chief Judicial Ethics Officer. What incalculable multi-generation gifts America gets when it acts justly and humanely toward people who have nothing but dust in their mouths and dreams in their hearts. How sadly different from the message anyone watching our country today would get. Separating families, demanding that people be thrown back across the border without due process, threatening to move refugees like pawns to sanctuary cities as political punishment. These things devalue our national character. They mock a defining promise of our nation as illuminated by the Statue of Liberty. They undermine the rule of law imbued in our Constitution. And they deprive us of people like my grandparents, and very likely, like many of your grandparents, who infuse our country with renewed purpose and vigor, who remind us by their misfortune not to bask in our own material comforts. Not everyone seeking entry is angelic, nor should they stay. But demonizing everyone only makes us the devil in this story. We are so much better than this. America is full, but not in the way the president means. It is as full as this room is full of honorable people who believe in and promote our nation's founding principles by their daily actions, who believe, as I do, that we are still the admirable country my grandparents struggled to reach, even illegally. I even believe that the United States will someday do right by their memory and actually call the Armenian genocide that they survived by its name. <laughs> that our government will finally realize that words matter and that presidential proclamations euphemistically referring to the terrible events and the past tragedy of 1915 are no more descriptive of genocide than starving Armenians was funny or about food. 
Եվ որ կալիցինք և որ դեղ հասանք պարտավոր ենք մեր հաջողյությունների, մեր նահատանքների և մեր վերապրացներին, մեր ձնողները և մեր թատիկները և պապերը։ Wherever we have walked, whatever we have achieved, we owe our good fortune to our martyrs and our survivors, our parents and our grandparents. My grandparents were much too modest to appreciate how heroic they were. Their names may not be on buildings. No marble statues or bronze plaques commemorate their courage. But they made it possible for me to succeed and appreciate just how lucky I am to be an American and how important it is to contribute to my country. And they do have monuments. Let me introduce a few of them. My daughter, Sarah, a music supervisor. My cousin, Anahi, the trade show organizer. My nephew, James, a lawyer. My sister, Renee, an Episcopal priest. The people my sister and I were so lucky to marry. My brother-in-law, Thomas, a psychologist. My wife, Barbara, a journalist. My aunt, Araxi, a retired dress shop owner. You've all met my cousin, Claire, an assistant US attorney. And my uncle, Onnik Dinkchan, who last year was honored by the Library of Congress and the Kennedy Center for a lifetime of preserving and spreading Armenian folk music all over the world. If my grandparents could not have imagined an evening such as this, in a place of privilege such as this, they surely could not have imagined their own names would be uttered in such a citadel of privilege and acceptance. So allow me tonight to resurrect their memory. Garabed and Zora Milian, Nishan and Orida Dinkchan, Hagop and Rose Tembekchan, and my parents, Edward and Arpina Tembekchan, whose love endures in the good hearts of my daughter, Sarah, my nephews, James, and William. I love all of them, and I thank all of you.